All right, let's open with a word of prayer this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your presence with us, for the gift of your love and your providence, for your salvation and your strength. Lord, we lift up to you those that we know are struggling with physical and emotional and spiritual issues. And we ask, Lord God, that you would continue in your faithfulness with them. For we know that as we lift them up to you tonight, you're not shocked. <laughs> you knew about it. You've already been dealing with it. You've already prepared. You've already been in the midst of every situation we know of and every situation we don't know a thing about. And so, Lord God, we just lift up our hearts to join with yours in confessing that you are God and we need you. We have no solutions to most of the problems that we face, and we need you. And we ask, Lord God, that you would continue to do what only you can do, and we trust you for the outcome, knowing that you love us and that you only want the best for us. Guide us through our conversation this evening and use us for your glory as we go from this place. In Christ's name, amen. All right, Bible books. Again, if you don't have them memorized yet, feel free to look in the first couple pages of your Bible, find the, the books listing, and let's do them together. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Okay. The question tonight is kind of deep. And I'm going to try to see if I can get us into some good water and figure out a way that we can just dog paddle for a little bit and see if we can understand some of these deeper theological ideas with the practical realities we live in. The question is this. Church tradition says Jesus was fully God and fully man. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 says that he emptied himself. How can he be fully God if he gave up some of his godness? Great question. So what we're looking at then is this idea of the nature of Jesus incarnate. Was he God? Was he man? Was he both? At what proportion and ratio? What God things did he not bring? What man things did he not? What God things did he? And so we got some really deep theological conversation to have tonight. But again, we can answer this question at a more surface level that helps us to understand it more clearly. First of all, I want you to understand that the Bible is very, very clear that Jesus was God and Jesus was man. If we look at the God examples, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, the Word was God, the only begotten of the Father. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 he was the very image or icon of the invisible God. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. John chapter 14 and verse 9 he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. 
John chapter 10, verse 30. I and the Father are one. There are countless statements in the New Testament that clearly communicate the omniscience, the omnipotence, the eternality, and the fullness of the deity in the flesh in Jesus Christ. Similarly, on the flip side of that coin, and for those of you that are taking notes, let me give you that to you again. That was John 1, 1 and 14. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. John chapter 14, verse 9. And John chapter 10, verse 30. So let's flip the coin then. What does the Bible say about Jesus being man? Well, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 17. Again, that's Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 17. Since the children have flesh and blood... He too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people." Just a few columns below in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Hebrews 4 and 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. You see, Jesus was a baby. He got tired. He got hungry. He mourned the death of his friend Lazarus. There are expressions all through the Gospels and the New Testament writings that Jesus was fully man and experienced the fullness of living on earth. So then it falls to the theologians to try to discern out, okay, so how does the nature of Christ I mean, we know who we are. We are fully human. We know who God is. He's fully God. What do you do with the God-man? And so this phrase was born out of theology. There's nowhere in Scripture, but it was born out of theologians trying to explain and express the Scripture that Christ was fully God and fully man. A concise depiction of who God is in Christ. And so that phrase has been handed around the church and has been heard by the world and challenged. But the reality is, we then do run into Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7. And Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 says, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a man, of a servant, being made in human likeness. Other translations say that he emptied himself. Well, what did he empty himself of? And how do we measure that? So this is the question that's being given to us this evening. And it gives me a great segue to the greatest progression of theology that we have record of, and that is the church creeds. It is important to remember, and this is one of those things my church history professor just beat into us, every creed was a response to a heresy what would happen is the church would establish a list of truth and someone would get something wrong. 
And they would say, oh, well, it must mean this. And the church would come back and go, no, 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 no. And they would change the wording so that it would make clearer what was truth and what was not truth. And so you'd get another creed. And then you get another creed. And so as you study the church, if you really want to understand the history of the church, you just need to study the history of the heresies, the history of the creeds. Because every time someone raised a question, the church had to decide what the scriptures really taught. And I don't mean that like we were making it up. It was trying to come to an understanding. Remember that the scriptures are written by men, but guided by God. And there is truth in the scriptures that is beyond our logical way of thinking. And so we have to discern and to understand and to follow the Holy Spirit to try to discern exactly what it was he was saying. And when we're talking about the nature of God, boy, there's a lot of room to get things wrong. And so the church would keep making the definition clearer and clearer and clearer. And so tonight I want to walk through some of those creeds. Some of you might think, well, I don't like creeds. I joined the Christian church because y'all have a statement that we have no creed but Christ. And that's true. As a restoration church, we have no creed but Christ. But it's important for you to understand that in the late 1700s and early 1800s, the creeds had been used as a test for membership. You couldn't become a member of a church unless you could quote their particular creed. And it was that that the Christian Restoration Movement rebelled against and said, look, the only thing we need is Jesus. We don't need your specific understanding of theology to be a part of the body of Christ. And so the Christian church rebels against creeds. We don't have a creed. We come in on Sunday mornings, we don't recite a creed. If you like one of the creeds, have fun reciting it. If you memorized one as a child, hold on to it. There's nothing wrong with any of the creeds. But they did not come solely out of theology. Several of them are biblical. And I would have you turn with me tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. Give you just a half a second to get there. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 7. Most theologians and Bible scholars believe this to be the first creed of the church. It was already in existence, I believe, before Paul wrote it down. I don't think Paul created it. I think he was simply sharing a truth that was already a part of the church and was informing and reminding the Corinthian church of this creed, this understanding of the truth of the gospel. As we look at 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, Paul writes, For I delivered to you as of a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter, then to all twelve disciples. Then He appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles." And so you have this first creed of Christ died for our sins, was buried, raised on the third day, appeared, and then was resurrected. That is the first creed, the whole story of Christianity in a couple of sentences. Similarly, in Philippians chapter 2, looking at verses 6 through 11, I have you turn, turn there with me. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to look specifically at verses 6 through 11. And some of you are going, wait a minute, didn't we just read Philippians 2, 7? Yes, we did. That 
phrase about the nature of Christ is out of one of these other biblical creeds. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 6 through 11. Beginning in verse 6. Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We know that these were written in the first century. By the second century, we have the birth of what is now known as the Apostles' Creed. And no, the Apostles didn't write it. It was a hundred years after them. Um, they, most scholars will put the Apostles' Creed being written somewhere about 180 A.D. So you have this Apostles' Creed. And you have a sheet tonight that is two-sided. And one of them starts Apostles' Creed to Nicene Creed. So you can look there with me at the Apostles' Creed. That's the one on the left. The Apostles' Creed, some of you may have learned growing up in church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. Buried. Some of the versions include he descended to the hell, uh, descended to hell, or he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead, or the quick and the dead, or as I've always made fun of it, the quick and the not so quick. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. By the way, if you grew up in a Catholic church, you have probably seen the Apostles' Creed with the word Catholic capitalized. If you grew up in a Protestant church that used the creed, you have seen that the C on Catholic was not capitalized. This will always be a debate, but let me just tell you this, the Greek doesn't have a capital. Okay? So in the original Greek, Catholic does not mean a particular brand of Christian faith. Catholic is an old word that means complete. So when we talk about the Catholic Church, we're talking about the whole church. Every church that claims the name of Christ is part of the small c Catholic Church. Okay. Um, so this one comes about about uh, A.D. 180. That then leads to about 150 years of use before one of the heresies comes up that starts to get some things wrong. And I'm not going to go into the heresies and go into what they did wrong or what they did right. What I want to show you is that they had to fix the creed because it was a little too general and it didn't get specific enough. What I have done on this sheet is everything that is on the left side is in bold on the right side. So what you can look at is what was added to the creed. As you look at this, you can see, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, in, Jesus, in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, he suffered, the third day rose again, ascended into heaven. So you, you can see the Apostles' Creed in the midst of this Nicene Creed. Okay, um, I want you to notice on your sheet, right here in the middle of the Nicene Creed, where it says both in heaven and on earth, is got brackets around it. That's because it was in the original Apostles' Creed, but all the way up at the top. 
It's got the brackets there just to show you, yeah, it's out of order, but it does belong because if you look at the Apostles' Creed, uh, let's see, yeah, second line, creator of heaven and an earth. When you get to the Nicene Creed, that whole heaven and on earth is down in the middle because of all the words they've added in. So it got moved around. So I just wanted you to see that that's there. So then let's look at how they changed this creed. We went from believing in God, the Father Almighty. Now look what we've done to talk about the Father a little bit more. God the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. All that was said in the Apostles' Creed is our Lord. But look what happens in the Nicene Creed. He is now begotten of the Father, the only begotten. That is of the same essence as the Father. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Wow! We're getting very specific, very narrow, because the heresy that had come up was that Christ was becoming like God. And the argument was, no, He is God. He's the same as the Father's, consubstantial. He was begotten. He wasn't created. See, the whole argument that came up in the 150 years between these two uh, creeds was that, you know, God the Father created Jesus. And the church said, no, Jesus was with the Father before creation. He's not a created being. He is God. He's part of the triune Godhead. And so what you see here is a much clearer delineation of the three members of the Godhead, the three persons. And so they're getting more specific to help people to not misunderstand the nature of the Trinity. Okay. by whom all things were made both in heaven and on earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was incarnate and was made man. He suffered, and the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, and in the Holy Ghost, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come Amen. And so you can see, if you really want to get into a fun study, start looking at the theological things that get changed between the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. For example, the introduction of baptism. It was always a part of the church. Now it's a part of the doctrine because before we just said there was forgiveness of sins. Now we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. The tie together of the baptism and the forgiveness. Okay. So then this takes, uh, the Apostles' Creed, like I said, was about 180 A.D., uh, the Nicene Creed is about 325 A.D., so about 150 years difference between the two. Next slide. Flip the page over. Between 325 and 381, um, actually, yeah, there is another shift in theology. Another heresy comes in. And so again, we have a revision. This time it goes from the Nicene to the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. Okay? And so after these 40 or 60 years, we needed a different or, or an updated, more specific. And again, I've done the exact same thing. I left the Nicene Creed alone and put it in bold on the right within the Nicene Constantinople. <laughs> Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. I can say that word. Um, and you can see again all the stuff that was added to make it clearer. Some of you grew up with the Nicene Creed and have re responded with this second one. Okay? 
because only theologians and historians refer to these two creeds as different because they were only 60 years apart. The church looks at the Nicene-Constantinopolitan creed as the Nicene creed. In a lot of books, you'll, you'll get the 381 version, not the 325 version. So again, that's just one of those updates. But let's look at this one. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. Oh, wait a minute, we had a combination. You know, the first one, the apostle just said heaven and earth. And the Nicene 325 said invisible, invisible. By the time we get to 381, we've combined them. Now it's heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible. You see, they're getting more and more specific, more and more narrow, trying to help the church understand the truth of Scripture in a condensed form. And in the one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds. Again, that whole argument of no, he's been here longer than the rest of us. Light of light, very God of gods, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven. It just said come down last time. Well, where did he come down from? The mountain? No, he came down from heaven. So they're helping to get it more and more specific here. Um, it was arc incarnate by the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary. Wow, this is a huge addition because we're talking about the nature of Christ being both of God the Father and the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary. So he's got this dual nature going on. Okay? Um, it was made man, he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried and on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end and in the Holy Ghost the Lord and giver of life who proceedeth from the Father who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified who spake with the prop... Wow, look what we just added to the Holy Spirit. The first three, we didn't really talk about the Holy Spirit much. And somebody finally went, well, who's the Holy Spirit? And Rudy opened a Sunday school class. No. And so who's the Holy Spirit? And so we get this whole new paragraph redefining because the other two just said, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, what do we believe about him? Well, let's, let's meet that out a little bit, okay? And in the one Catholic apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remissions of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. That creed was followed by another creed called by the Chalcedonian Creed by A.D. 451. So 60 years later, there was a need for another creed. I didn't give you that one. I just wanted to share the reason I didn't give it to you. And you can uh, darken the slide, thank you. The reason I didn't give it to you is because they go a totally different direction. When you get to 451 and the Chalcedonian Creed, they come at this differently from this point forward. They don't keep changing the creed. They started fresh. They just hit reset. Listen to the words of the Chalcedonian Creed. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood. Truly God and truly man, of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, 
but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son and only begotten, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning Him. And the Lord Jesus Christ Himself taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. And so when you get to the Chalcedonian Creed of A.D. 451, they have now really focused on this question of the nature of God, or of Christ. Truly God, truly man. Fully God, fully man. And their answer was that, yes, there are two different natures, but they are not overlapped. They are not 80% one, 20% the other. They're not 50-50. He has the full nature of God and the full nature of man coexisting in a single person. Okay? So the church makes this comment in the Chalcedonian Creed that he was not of a split nature, but of a dual nature. All God, all man, all the time. He wasn't 90% God and 10% man. He wasn't 90% man and 10% God. He was fully God all the time, 100%. And fully man all the time, 100%. And we go, wait, that doesn't make sense. Because he's the only one. None of the rest of us will ever experience that. None of the rest of us were conceived by the Holy Spirit. None of the rest of us were born of a virgin. I don't care what she told you. So you have this creed that begins this conversation about this nature of Christ being fully God and fully man. There's a final creed I want to share with you because it has some beautiful insights. And, and I think it followed the Chalcedonian Creed. It's called the Athanasian Creed after a man by the name of Athanasius. And Athanasius lived at the same time as the council at Chalcedon at which the Chalcedonian Creed was made in AD 451. But the Athanasian Creed, the first time we have it written down in history is in 633. But it's referred to as though it has been around for a while in that writing. So we know that somewhere between 450 and 633 it was actually written. But nobody believes Athanasius wrote it. The language and some of the heresies that it was talking about were after Athanasius' time. But it still got his name on it. Okay, uh, But the Athanasian Creed begins like this. Whoever desires to be saved should above all hold to the Catholic faith. Anyone who does not keep it whole and unbroken will doubtless perish eternally. Now this is the Catholic faith. That we worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity. Neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. For the person of the Father is a distinct person. The person of the Son is another, and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one. Their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. What quality the Father has, the Son has, and the Holy Spirit has. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, and the Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is immeasurable, the Son is immeasurable, the Holy Spirit is immeasurable. The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal. And yet there are not three eternal beings. There is but one eternal being. So too, there are not three uncreated or immeasurable beings, but there is one uncreated and immeasurable being. Similarly, 
The Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Spirit is Almighty. Yet there are not three Almighty beings. Here is but one Almighty being. Thus the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Yet there are not three gods. There is but one God. Thus the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. Yet there are not three lords. There is but one Lord. Just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually as both God and Lord, so Catholic religion forbids us to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten from anyone. The Son was neither made nor created. He was begotten from the Father alone. The Holy Spirit was neither made nor created nor begotten. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. Accordingly, there is one Father, not three fathers. There is one Son, not three sons. There is one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. Nothing in this Trinity is before or after. Nothing is greater or smaller. In their entirety, the three persons are co-eternal and co-equal with each other. So in everything, as we said earlier, we must worship their trinity in their unity and their unity in their trinity. Anyone then who desires to be saved should think thus about the trinity. But it is necessary for eternal salvation that one also believe in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully. Now this is the true faith, that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. He is God from the essence of the Father, begotten before time, and He is human from the essence of His mother, born in time. Completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father as regards humanity. Although He is God and human, yet Christ is not two, but one. He is one, however, not by divinity being turned into flesh, but by God's taking humanity to Himself. He is one, certainly not by the blending of His essence, but by the unity of His person. For just as one human is both rational soul and flesh, so too the one Christ is both God and human. He suffered for our salvation. He descended to hell. He arose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the Father's right hand. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming all people will arise bodily and give an accounting of their own deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life, and those who have done evil will enter eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. One cannot be saved without believing it firmly and faithfully. And we're done. No, I'm kidding. So what was developed by the church in its understanding, and guys, please hear me say that very, very carefully. The theology of God did not evolve. The theology of God got clearer. It was a tough idea that it took us a couple hundred years to articulate well. And each creed was trying to get tighter and tighter and tighter with the definition so that it was clearer. It wasn't like, oh, here's a great idea, let's make him this. It was coming to an understanding, just as a scientist today will take the data that is given them and work on it and work on it and work on it and work on it until they come to an understanding that fits every situation. So the theologian keeps coming back to this biblical data over and over and over to try to hone it down to what is the essential truth. The nature of Christ, then, is what is referred to by the church as the hypostatic union. Ooh. Some of you may have heard that term before. It's not that big a deal. 
Hypostatic is simply an Old English word that means person. The substance or essential nature of an individual. And so a hypostatic union means that he's got this person thing going on, but it's in unity. He's got the God person and the human person going on in unity. So it is a hypostatic union. He has a dual nature simultaneously. Not part and part, but whole and whole. Fully God, fully man. So that now that I've gone through and explained that, then let's deal with the question of, so what do you do with Philippians 2.7? Well, as I looked at this, I looked up every Bible version I could find and how they translated this phrase of Philippians 2.7. NRSV, ESV, NASB 95, Darby, ASV 1901, HCSB, LEB, NET, RSV, and YLT all say emptied. AV 1873, Word Study KJV, AV, KGV uh, 1900, and New King James are of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation. The NIV, in all of its various iterations, he made himself nothing. I really enjoyed some of the independence. The ISV said, instead, poured out in emptiness. Good news, Bible. He gave up all that he had. New living. He gave up his divine privileges. The message. He set aside the privileges of deity. New century version, he gave up his place with God. So it still sounds like he gave something up. And this is where we come back to my stomping point. Context, context, context. What is Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 in the context of. You should still be in Philippians chapter 2, so I'm going to ask you to turn somewhere else. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Because just a few verses before chapter 2 begins, we get this beginning of a thought between Paul the author and the Philippian church. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Here's your thought. You all should behave like Jesus to each other. Whatever happens, doesn't leave any wiggle room. Whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Okay, so what he's set up here is, you all need to treat each other like Jesus would treat you. You guys need to use the model of Christ. 
to know how to engage with one another. And so let's get right down to brass tacks. Your attitude is the problem. So you should have the same attitude Christ had. And this is where we get into this theological area. What was the attitude of Christ Jesus? Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. Paul's whole conversation here with the church at Philippi is not so that he can make a theological treatise about the nature of Christ. His conversation is about the attitude of Christ. That being God, he was divine, creator of all heaven and earth, and yet... In his attitude, he made himself the lowest. He emptied himself, not of nature, but of glory, of pride. He didn't say, well, I'm God, I don't have to do that. Take off my clothes and wash your feet? I don't think so. No. He even washes the feet of the man who would betray him. He goes from the divine to the lowest servant. He gave himself up for us. Did that change his nature? No. He was still God. But he was demonstrating servanthood. He was still fully God. He did not divest himself of anything to become man. He simply put on form as a man. He was fully flesh, fully blood, fully like you and I, but he was also fully God. So he did not divest himself of anything. He simply gave up position and glory. It's fascinating to me how many of the writers of the New Testament will refer to someday we will see Christ in His glory. Because there was only one time we've ever seen Christ in His glory and only three boys saw it. They called it the transfiguration. When Christ was on top of the mountain, and it looked like he was in garments shining white and he was carrying on a conversation with the prophets that had gone before him. That was the only time in Christ's existence on earth when he shone in his glory. Did he pick it back up again or did he flip a switch? No. He simply allowed it to shine. He could have walked this earth in the full majesty of his glory but then we would have followed him like a circus trick, not like a savior. 
And so being fully God, he did not give up his essence or his deity. We look at it in context and we see that he gave up his due position. He let us whip him and nail him to a cross. He became a servant. The ultimate humiliation. Paul's message to the Philippians regards their attitude towards one another and that they are supposed to follow Christ's example. Remember that next time somebody takes your seat on a Sunday morning. Remember that next time you go into the kitchen and somebody moved the spatula that you put in that drawer last Wednesday. Remember that next time something gets scheduled and it's not on your schedule. We are to have the same attitude of grace and humility and giving up of ourselves to one another that Christ the Almighty God in the flesh demonstrated to us. Fully God. Fully man. Fully servant. He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have walked off that cross. He could have split the earth under His foot. He could have said, you are finished. Instead of it is finished. But He chose to give us life. He who was due all honor placed Himself in ultimate dishonor for us. Why would the, we then choose the pride of putting another person down as though they were some kind of subordinate? Heavenly Father, I thank You for this Word tonight. We sometimes get so caught up in the words of theology that we miss the point. Lord, You are fully God. For only You are holy. And You are fully man. For only a man could fulfill the necessary sacrifice for all of humanity. How You subsisted co-equally within Your own self is beyond our understanding. But we know, Lord God, that You are God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one, unified. And that somehow You were able to combine the totality of the essence of the Creator God and the essence of fallen man and not be a sinner in the midst of it. For that sin would have deprived your deity. You walked this earth as Adam, who until that fruit knew no sin. But unlike Adam, you chose not to bite on Satan's lie. Lord, we understand that You are who You say You are. You have demonstrated it by Your resurrection and ascension. You will claim it with Your second coming. And then You will be made Lord and King over all things for all eternity. And we, Your people, will rejoice with You. Help us to hear the lesson to the Philippians that we should adjust our attitude to love as You love, to give grace as You give grace, to preserve our humility rather than our pride, that we might serve You as You served the world. And we'll thank You for it in Christ's name. Amen.